Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask everyone to please take a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, is this on? If I could ask people to take a seat, this is so impressive, this turnout. I think we have, uh, we have standing room, sitting room outside, but I hope everyone can find a sp space in here who, who would like to. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute. I'm thrilled to see all of you here today. A special welcome to uh, all those in active duty. We have lots of veterans here today, uh, people representing various veterans organizations. And I want to tell you that, that uh, a focus on veterans has become increasingly important to our trustees and to the Institute. And I think you will see more and more programming that we do uh, around issues critical to uh, veterans as they return to the country. Uh, just as one example, uh, uh, the dean of our trustees with respect to our public policy programs, Madeleine Albright, uh, who I'm sorry that she can't be here today. This is a particularly important issue to her. As a matter of fact, last year she launched with a contribution she made herself a scholarship program uh, here at the Institute uh, where only el uh, veterans are eligible to apply for and to bring them to uh, many of the different programs that we do here in New York and Aspen and around uh, the country. Uh, the issues here are uh, profoundly important. Uh, they touch so many of us. Uh, as a matter of fact, my son-in-law tells me about these challenges uh, on a regular basis. He teaches medicine at Yale Medical School and has just opened a clinic for homeless veterans uh, in Connecticut. And it is astonishing to me the, the breadth and scope of, of the challenge that we have. In any event, we are thrilled to be here. We hope we will see uh, you and, and uh, your associates uh, at future events. Uh, our hope here is not just to uh, elevate these issues and bring attention to them, but to actually lead to significant solutions and improvements uh, in the welfare of veterans and their families coming back to the United States. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Fran Marie Kennedy, who will uh, introduce our panel today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elliot. Um, and I, I echo his uh, warm welcome. This really is a very significant gathering. And I'm very, very happy to announce that uh, the intent of the Institute is to have a series of ongoing conversations about veterans. And we are the first program to actually launch one. Uh, we will not be the last, <coughs> but we are definitely the first, which is wonderful. Um, a little something about the uh, Institute, and then I'm going to talk to you about the program uh, and our basic goal. Uh, the Aspen Institute is a 63-year-old nonprofit, uh, really nonpartisan uh, think tank that is dedicated to values-based leadership. And so every one of our programs always starts our convenings thinking, what is it that we can do in this space that is of great significance. So uh, the Aspen convening that we're doing started with a group that basically uh, was brought together by a number of different uh, events. In 2007 and 2009, the Aspen Health Program actually um, hosted uh, an ideas festival of health. So we called it the Aspen Health Forum. And uh, in the planning, uh, I met Barbara Van Dalen and she said, if you're going to do all aspects of health and wellness, then certainly you have to do something on veterans. And so she was kind enough to underwrite the first one, and we of course invited her back to the 2009 because it was so significant and important to do. And then we of course said, uh, we've got to be a part of our ongoing event. So she's one of our advisors. Uh, and so the next significant thing, um, before Madeline's um, gift, was that uh, John Shelton, publisher of the Journal for Clinical Psychiatry, started sending me articles of uh, you know, really important things that are actually being published about PTSD and veterans. And he kept saying, you've got to do something. Aspen has got to do something about this. So in 2011, he and I put together a group of critical voices in the room. Uh, Peter couldn't make it, but he's a critical voice in the room. And we convened in uh, April of 2012, 
And it was that convening that Elliot actually opened, and we came together to say, this is something that Aspen can do. We need to look at what we can do for the frontline providers in the, the civilian community, because that's the gap in services that we need to address. And that's what we're doing with this program. So I'm very, very, very excited to be able to, in fact, introduce you to Peter Long, who is our sponsor, main sponsor of this uh, undertaking, as well as uh, Pharma. Thank you very much. And Peter is the president and CEO of the Blue Shield of California Foundation. Prior to that, he was in a leadership role in the Kaiser Family Foundation, as well as the California Endowment. But uh, more significantly, he has been a friend of the Aspen Institutes for years. He has participated in all of our events. He's moderated, he's spoken, and he's still on our uh, website for the 2009 performance at the Aspen Health Forum. So I take it to Peter. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here at the launch of the Aspen Institute Veterans Initiative. Um, I think it's a great opportunity and it's a great moment in time for this issue. Let me start, because I think many of you in the room are scratching your head if you don't know Blue Shield of California Foundation. Why is a California healthcare foundation sponsored by an insurance company uh, involved in veterans' mental health? And I think it's, I want to take one or two minutes just to walk through how we came here and why we're in this room and why we're so excited to uh, work with Aspen and, and many of the folks on the stage here. We start, um, our mission is to end domestic violence in California. And we observe that one of the populations, we have the largest uh, military, uh, largest number of military families and veterans in the nation. And we observe that the rates of domestic violence are very high. Those families are incredibly vulnerable due to the combat stress and many other factors, moves, um, all of the things that are happening in their environment. So we said as a funder, what can we do um, to address that issue? How can we come and be part of the solution? If we really are trying to end domestic violence in California, this is a population we need to work with. This is an issue we need to work on. Um, we did not come with huge military expertise. Um, we did not come with cultural sensitivity to military issues. We came with a deep belief that we want to be part of the solution um, to prevent violence in those homes. We said we need research, and we uh, met folks at Blue Star Families and uh, IAVA and others to say what's the extent of the problem, um, how, do we know what domestic, how do we know what domestic violence rates are, what are some of the causes. And then we got to what we're going to be working on, I think you'll be working on with the Aspen Initiative, is what are some of the practical solutions to address it. And we worked with Dr. Taff here on stage um, with some simple interventions that combine public and private sector and look to expand the work of the VA and the DOD with community-based organizations. Again, if you think about it, we're a funder, so we, we fund not-for-profits um, to do work, and we do them in partnership with government. So we've tested a few different models and had some actually very, very good success. But what we realized is if you really want to address the problem, you need to keep going. You can't stop at just practical interventions in a few community organizations. Um, we can't be at March Air Force Base and have a great partnership between a domestic violence organization. We can't be at San Jose State and uh, have a program for returning vets at California State Universities. You have to keep going into the policy world. You have to keep going to the VA, to the DOD, and engage, actively engage in the policy conversation if you want to be institutionalized and you want to take this all the way to its conclusion to actually end violence. Um, and so then we also quickly discovered that this is about public-private partnerships. When you go in and begin to speak, about, speak with federal officials, um, you realize that this is not done only on bases, installations, and in government facilities. It's actually happening in communities across the country. And so how do you begin to bridge those partnerships? So our first set of grants were all around testing solutions to the issue, but we figured out that it's actually about policy solutions and bringing actors to the table and trying to solve this issue at scale. If you're really serious about addressing the issue, you need to take it on at scale, you need to take on policy issues, and you need to bring the public and private sector together. So we couldn't be more excited that the Aspen Institute, uh, to support the Aspen Institute in this work, because I think all of this in this room recognize we know a lot more about the what in mental health. We know about homelessness, suicide, domestic violence, sexual assault. Um, we know the risk factors. There have been many, many papers published recently. Uh, we know who it's happening to. We know that the time is now with the drawdown of troops. 
What we really need to focus on, I think, is the how. How do we get things done? How do we actually move forward collectively at scale um, to address the more than a million service members who will be uh, leaving the service in the next few years? So that's why we couldn't be more excited that it's Aspen, that they specialize in this, and that they're sticking with this for the next five years. Because oftentimes you have great conversations, people come up with solutions, we brainstorm, we all go home back to our communities, and they, the ideas um, stay in that room. But the fact that Aspen, with their convening power, with their ability to resources, their partnership with the journal, um, really is a signal that they are serious about following this issue through. So we couldn't be happier in partnering. Um, my real task here is to introduce the panel, because I think what you are here to hear from are four of the brightest folks um, who have been working on this for quite a while and really are in the trenches. And so I'm pleased to introduce Jim Dow, who's a reporter covering military and veterans affairs for the National Desk of the New York Times. I've read some of his work in preparing for this and, and seen it as a subscriber to the New York Times, and I couldn't think of a better person to moderate this panel. Uh, Jim writes about the military world from the ground up, looking at issues ranging from health care for veterans to the culture and daily life of active duty <coughs> troops and their families and at, war, at war and at home. He's an accomplished writer, winning an Emmy and an Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award for his story, uh, for his series, A Year at War. And he's also the co-editor of the Times military, Af military Affairs blog, At War. So, Jim, thank you. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> and thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Um, greatly honored to be here. Um, I think for those of you who uh, are in the business of caring for veterans, and I'm, I'm guessing that's probably just about everyone here, you all know that the job doesn't get any easier when wars end. Uh, indeed, I'm sure it's going to get harder. And uh, that's one of the great uh, puzzlements to the public and probably to many in government. They think as the wars end, these issues go away and we can move on to the next big domestic problem. Uh, but we have mental health problems like post-traumatic stress disorder, which may not emerge for months or even years after service <coughs> ends. Science still doesn't have foolproof methods of detecting, diagnosing, or, or really treating traumatic brain injury. And indeed, the, the science of traumatic brain injury is, is, is in its infancy, really. Um, and uh, we know that, as, as Peter points out, things like homelessness, uh, domestic uh, violence, and the suicide rate among active duty troops and, and to some degree veterans are, are all on the rise. And, and while you can't make generalizations about an entire generation based on those kinds of statistics, they certainly give you an indication that there are things that are wrong. Um, and on top of it all, as thousands and thousands of veterans are moving into the civilian world, uh, the economy is going to be challenged to give them meaningful jobs, and not just uh, minimum wage jobs, but jobs that utilize the skills that they gained in the military. So then what can, what can society, what can government uh, and community groups do to care for this burgeoning generation? That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I think probably everyone here would agree that the Department of Veterans Affairs often does exceptional work in caring for veterans. I think probably uh, even officials in the VA would agree that they are at best taxed by this process and, and often completely overwhelmed. And so then the question emerges, where, where can communities uh, uh, organize to help? How do nonprofits and how do for-profit corporations get involved uh, in filling those gaps? Um, and so our panelists today all have immense experience in these things. Uh, on my left, we have Barbara Van Dalen, uh, founder and president of Given Hour. Casey Taft, who's an associate professor of psychiatry at uh, uh, Boston University and uh, is also affiliated with the, um, the National Center for PTSD uh, at the Boston VA Medical Center, right? Uh, Paul Rykoff, the uh, founder and chief executive of Iraq and Afghan Veterans of America, the, the largest and I guess maybe the first, the only, uh, veterans group for post-9-11 veterans. And uh, Kobe Langley, who's a senior advisor for veterans, wounded warriors, and military family initiatives at the Corporation for National and Community Service. Um, I wanted to kick things off by uh, uh, giving you all a chance to talk a little bit about, generally, about your work. Um, Barbara, I was going to start with you. Um, your group is probably the ultimate gap filler of, uh, in, this, in this area. Um, and I, I was 
hoping maybe you could tell, tell the group a little bit about what you do, but also why you, you created this organization and what, what it is you think you're achieving right now. Sure, um, and thank you, um, Fran Marie and the Action Institute, for allowing us to have this conversation. Um, so given our, I founded it almost eight years ago. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist. My father was a World War II veteran, and I grew up with a he very healthy respect for service. I also grew up watching the um, aftermath of the Vietnam War when I was in training as a psychologist. And so the idea for given hour was very simple. Ask the mental health professionals in our country to step up and literally give an hour a week of their time because that's how mental health professionals typically work, it's an hour a week uh, to see someone or a family, and ask them to give that uh, to our service members and, and their families. That's how we started. What's happened over the last eight years, because of the changing, um, really my changing awareness of what the needs were, very quickly we recognized that there were wonderful organizations, many of whom are represented up here with me and many out in the audience, who were doing great work in communities in different places, in employment, in education, but they didn't necessarily have the mental health um, information and background. And so we very quickly started to add to the direct service piece by then working to give our services to other nonprofits, working with government entities. Um, so that's one way that we've shifted because, and one of the things that I'm very passionate about and I hope we can talk about today is mental health First of all, we all have mental health, whether we're a veteran, a civilian, a family member. It depends on, on what's happening in our lives, what's happened to us. That's what determines our mental health at any particular moment in time. And so our job as a nation is to make sure we provide easy access to care, um, that we provide different options, because regardless of what we talk about in terms of treatments, one size does not fit all. Certain things are very helpful for certain issues, certain uh, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, we can talk about that, but one size doesn't fit all across any population uh, that we have yet found. So we need to be smart and think about how do we give the mental health knowledge and expertise that our, our folks, our 7,000 plus providers and growing, um, can give not only to directly to service members and their families and veterans, but to um, faith-based leaders and teachers and first responders so that the community understands these issues. And in terms of what we're seeing on the front line, in some ways it's been um, fascinating to watch a progression. I do think we are making progress in terms of folks' awareness of these issues, but we also keep seeing and hearing the same stories that families will say to us over and over again, I didn't understand what was happening to my son, my daughter, my husband, my, my wife. I didn't know how to get him or her help. I didn't realize it was as, as, had gotten as bad as it had become. So even though we've made progress, it, sometimes I feel like you know, with some families, we haven't gotten to them yet at all. And so we still need to work on that. And um, lastly, I guess I'll, I'll say, and I'll stop and hope again that we come back to some of these issues, with our mental health professionals. You know, given our, what we've seen in the last year, and this is to Jim's point about the drawdown of the war, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of hours that we're giving. Our providers have now given that we can count, and we, we assume that there's actually a lot more, but based on surveys of the folks in our network, over 80,000 hours. Um, but what we've seen in the last year is where before we were doing about 3,000 hours a quarter, it's now jumped to 10,000 hours a quarter. So something is happening. And the good news is more people are seeking care, but we certainly aren't seeing a decrease in the demand or the need. And as we go into communities and as we work with installations and guard units, there's more of a desire to have what we have, what we know, and so to the point of what the Aspen Institute is now doing, how do we make sure that the community mental health professionals in our country are prepared? Um, they don't all have to, to treat in one given way, but how are they prepared so they understand this culture, they know different tools um, to make that difference for these families? Thank you. Uh, Casey, um, you work in the area of domestic violence. Um, the problems um, veterans, uh, active duty military bring home can sometimes radiate it into their family life. Work was on understanding the problem of, of domestic violence in military populations. 
And one thing I discovered pretty early on is that there is a fair amount of work showing that domestic violence, violence rates are higher in veterans than civilians, but the research wasn't really taking that next step to, well, what do we do about the problem? Um, first, what are some of the explanations for why trauma and PTSD might lead to family problems and violence? And then what are the interventions that need to be developed to, to target this problem? Um, there are a lot of community-based domestic violence programs out there that don't really fit the needs of service members, where they don't really take trauma and into account. Mm -hmm. So um, pretty early on, um, I recognized this, this gap in, the, in services for service members and veterans, and we were fortunate to receive funding from the DOD and the CDC and the VA to develop what's called the Strength at Home programs. So these are programs designed specifically to prevent domestic violence in returning service members. Uh, so it's primary prevention where we're preventing the violence before it begins in these at-risk couples. And we have other, another program that's designed specifically for service members or veterans who are actually domestically violent. Um, so we've been doing these programs for about five or six years now, doing large-scale uh, randomized clinical trials to show that they're effective. Is what, what we hope to do is show, have empirical support and have uh, based programs that we can say that we know these programs work and then to disseminate these programs more widely. Paul, uh, you've got the largest group representing post 9-11 veterans. Um, you cover a whole universe of issues, um, but I've noticed in the last year or so perhaps more and more you seem to be working on issues of community uh, services for veterans. Um, it seems like an interesting new avenue for the organization to move into. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how that's going and why, why the group has been moving in that direction. Sure. Um, and first, thank you to Fran Marie and Elliot and everyone at the Aspen Institute for making this happen. Um, I was in Aspen this summer and saw General McChrystal kind of issue a challenge to the Aspen community. Um, and Admiral Mullen did the same. And to see Aspen respond is, has been very encouraging. Um, and, and Jim, your voice has been uh, a game changer. Um, for us, it starts at the community level because that's where it always starts. Um, my first active duty deployment was at Ground Zero in Manhattan after 9-11. Uh, I was an infantry officer and definitely didn't expect that my first um, essential combat tour would be in Manhattan. Um, but that's where it started for me and then I served a tour in Iraq and came home and recognized there was really no network for my generation of veterans. Um, there was nowhere for us to go to connect with each other and to connect with the programs that can improve our lives. So. Um, me and a few other veterans did what we did in Iraq, uh, the, the old saying, adapt, improvise, and overcome. Um, this was before Facebook, so we had a MySpace page, and then we had a, a website, and uh, the website became an organization, the organization developed programs, and the programs have now developed into a movement. So we've got Bassett. They're not victims around the country who've come to Washington to tell their stories. Um, they're representing those local communities. This, this week, uh, we're focused on ending the VA backlog which is the top priority for our membership. We're also going to be focused on the suicide rate, on employment, women's issues. Um, but it starts at that community level. And I guess what's unique about our organization is we can find out in real time what's happening, whether it's through Twitter or Facebook or text. Uh, this, this community and this generation is not shy about making their voices heard. And the technology empowers you to understand where it's not. Uh, and we can avoid and now we're trying to, to end the backlog. So it will continue to evolve because our veterans' needs are evolving. And I think that's the dynamic for any successful business or organization going forward. You've got to listen to the customers. And, and, and we've got a number of them here. And, and uh, I, would, I would encourage everybody to watch them all week. Um, you can follow us uh, at IAVA.org. They'll be tweeting. They'll be carrying the stories of their families and their units. And I think, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of people who, who do teamwork and working as a unit. We're all part of their lives. And uh, I think there's, you know, Barbara can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think there's a sense among many providers that that, that, can, be, that can be a problem for people when they go back, when they start reintegrating. And so, so uh, this, is, this is where you work, and it seems like there's a, there's a growing number of organizations that are thinking about how do you transform that sort, of, um, that sort of community service ethic into a way to help people heal or help them integrate. And, and maybe you can talk. Yeah, thanks, Jim. You know, I think um, what you're really talking about is you're talking about a service ethos, and uh, can stand up and, and they say, we're going to do it. Um, and looked upon that ethos, the idea uh, is you take federal dollars and in investments and taxpayer dollars and in investments, and you leverage those dollars inside of communities 
by helping those nonprofit organizations that serve those communities do better with their work. It's a pretty simple idea, really. Um, to, the idea of taking uh, human capital, people power, placing that people power in nonprofit organizations that are doing the good work on the ground, and then just getting out of their way, right? We're kind of like the BASF, if you will, of, of community <laughs> service or nonprofits. We don't actually do a whole lot, <laughs> uh, but, but the nonprofit organizations that we support do an amazing amount of work. So last year we supported over 2,000 nonprofits nationwide. Uh, there are over 76,000 AmeriCorps members uh, who receive a regular monthly stipend, who receive health care benefits, uh, who receive <laughs> child care if necessary, and who receive an education award. The idea of taking that amount of human capital power, and there's also 300,000 senior core members that we support around the country. The idea of taking that kind of human capital, uh, that community capital that's inside nonprofit organizations and state agencies, and then shifting it to focus on veterans and military families is really what this is all about. Uh, and that's what I'm here at the corporation to, you know, to help do is, is to get, get us moving in the direction of, of shifting some of those assets and resources to uh, get our community network focused on the veteran and military family initiatives, uh, and then to encourage veterans to join us Right, to encourage veterans to become AmeriCorps members, to encourage military family members who volunteer at three times the national rate to become an AmeriCorps member, to receive the benefits of that service, and to continue to serve their own community. And if I could follow up on that for one second, and um, this is a question we'll probably try to get everybody to address, is how do you, find, how do you get those veterans to sign up? How do you find them? What are, what are you doing to go out and get them? Well, that's is actually part of it. Uh, you know, a big part of it is just getting out the word. I mean, honestly, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the idea of, of, of becoming an AmeriCorps member uh, to most people in uniform isn't probably their first option uh, when they transition out. Um, but it should be an option. It should be an option if you think about the idea of continuing your service, which is what you would start talking about. Um, the idea of, of how do I keep that mission-oriented focus? Um, how do I wake up every day, uh, know that I have a task to do to help my community accomplish something very, very important? In this case, we're talking about behavioral health. Um, and, and a large part of that is, is speaking directly with the military. So we're in constant discussions with the Department of Defense and the Chairman's Office. Uh, and actually, our entire strategy is based upon a white paper that was written in, in 2009 in this area to focus community-based efforts on employment, wellness, and education. Uh, so we work very closely with the Department of Defense. We try to work as closely as we can with the Department of Veterans Affairs to get, just get the word out that these opportunities exist. Um, and, and really, a lot of it is, is, is happenstance. Usually, somebody that knows an AmeriCorps member or worked in a national service program tells somebody in uniform uh, you know, about the program. And that happens quite frequently. And it's a very effective recruitment mechanism when somebody who is in service gets connected to service and then recruits somebody else in service and says, hey, listen, guy, when you wake up in the morning, we're going to go work on a fire trail uh, in, in, in the middle of, of the forest in, in Colorado, and we're going to you know, help uh, save somebody's house, uh, and we're going to do it together. Yes, please. So I think that's a, a great question, of not only about service, but about um, pulling together. Um, and again, back to you know, the progress we've made. And you know, Paul and I have known each other for a long time, and I think he would probably agree. Certainly when I got involved in this work eight years ago, we were, meaning we in the nonprofit space, were as siloed as the DOD and the VA. And, and what's changing is there are now collective, collaborative efforts. And that is the key in terms of in the communities, because we can all be here in Washington and talk about what we want to do and what we think is going to work and how to make that happen. But if you don't have people in the communities, like the 40 guys from IAVA who are here, who are from their own communities, who are there and being ambassadors, getting the word out, um, you don't reach people. Um, and this notion of service and volunteerism, there are several people here who are involved in a couple of big initiatives. Uh, one is the community blueprint work um, that many of us are involved with which is an in, on the ground in communities, bringing groups together. Part of that effort is about volunteerism. It's not just about what can we do for our military, but it's, like, it's about going out to them and saying, we need you to step up and be involved and engage and be the leaders, that, as Paul mentioned. Another is Got Your Six. It's the entertainment industry. It's a bunch of nonprofits trying to connect dots. And I believe that as we move forward, what all of us here in this room can do and, and must do is continue to be catalyst conveners, bringing together at that community level, because that's where people live. They live in their communities. They need access to care. Communities are going to look different in how they they find each other and what they do. And obviously, of course, social media um, is a huge piece. But it's it's got to be 
in the community that we do this work. Right. And it, it's got to be a focus. I mean, outreach is not something you do as a pastime. It's not something you do in addition to your core work. I mean, if it was, the Marine Corps and the military wouldn't spend so much time recruiting people. I mean, you've got to focus on outreach. And one of the things that IAVA does, I think, better than almost anybody outside of the active duty is identify, verify, and deliver veterans. Uh, it's a very hard thing to do. We're still trying to improve that machine every day, um, but it requires money, it requires resources, it requires social media. We've had a public service announcement campaign with the Ad Council that g generated over $100 million in donated media, but it's got to be a part of your business, right? And, and you've got to understand you can't just push out an email and expect veterans to just come flying in, and you can't host PTSD Day and expect a bunch of people to show up. It, it's it's got to be a thoughtful outreach strategy that focuses on what veterans want. Um, and again, it goes back to empowering that customer. So we find uh, that our programs are successful. They want help finding a job. They want to know how to use the GI Bill. Uh, they want to just get together sometimes around Veterans Day or Memorial Day. But the thing that drives our engagement and our community growth more than anything else is a sense of community. That's our secret sauce, is whether you're doing it online or on the ground, creating that magic space where veterans can just be around each other without somebody asking them how many people they killed or uh, not understanding that women make up you know, close to 15% of the home program in terms of outreach because that we learned some really important lessons early on. When we first started the Strength of Home programs, we kind of went with the old model where we develop a program, we're housed in the VA, and you wait for the veterans to come. It's great wants to put a little team together and um, now that you can't just passively wait for folks to come in, you really have to go out to go out to the veterans. Enlisting family members in our programs is also a really uh, helpful thing for, for bringing veterans in. Uh, we find trials uh, at the VA to see, you know, if there's interventions. Well, sort of as a, a related question to all that, I, I wanted to, and I can, this, all of you are qualified to talk about this, is maybe talk a moment about stigma and, and the issue of uh, why officials say they don't think that it's just an issue of not having enough programs, it's an issue of getting people to come in and then stick with the programs and stick with the treatment. And so uh, does this change when people leave the, the service? Does the stigma melt away? Is it still there? And if it's still there, then what, what needs to be done to try to break that down? Well, I, I mean, I think if I ask people right now, raise your hand if you've ever had to struggle with a mental health issue. Probably not everybody in here who had would raise their hand. Mm -hmm. So stigma isn't just a military right. or a veteran issue. And this is something that I talk a lot about and it's, it's a passion because we shouldn't and it's not helpful to focus this, that issue as just a military population. Um, within the veteran population, I think about myself and I should be tough enough, I should be smart enough, I should be a good enough parent that my kid doesn't need anything, and on and on and on. And so. We just need to be very smart when we're targeting this population with messaging. Asking peers to speak up is an incredibly powerful tool that we find over and over again. We partner with lots of organizations with their team members, with their veterans, to help them learn how to be peer-based support to others. That's often a way, but then again, that's not the only way because in our network of 7,000 providers, many of whom are civilians, we often hear from veterans and military personnel that they like the option of going to somebody in the community. So again, I'm, it's back to my <laughs> somewhat of a broken record about one size doesn't fit all and about being smart and offering options. But I, you know, I, I can't stress enough this notion of you know, mental health is an issue. Um, we all have mental health and we all struggle with recognizing and tolerating those issues in ourselves and our loved ones. And, in a way, I believe that because we in the military and veteran space have been dealing with these issues now for a decade, which is, it's an opportunity for this population to really become champions of, it's tough to deal with whatever we have to deal with, but we can do it. And here's why it's important. Um, so I see that as a, as a positive. I would say w one challenge kind of layered on top of that is when uh, returning service members struggling with trauma-related issues and PTSD, uh, part, of, part of the disorder involves avoidance. So uh, when you have PTSD or related trauma-related problems, uh, the last thing you want to do is talk about your problems. So it's, it's part of the actual disorder, and then, but the best way to treat it is actually to talk to somebody about it. So it just adds a whole layer of complexity in terms of bringing people in and getting them the help that they need. 
And I, stigma is a, a big problem. I think we all know that, especially because of the, the macho culture of the military. And I think that that is evolving. We're, we're getting people to understand you've got to treat post-traumatic stress disorder as a wound in the same way you would a bullet injury, right? And if you don't treat that injury, you're not going to be ready for the fight. You're not going to be ready for your family. You're not going to be ready for a job. And you can be stronger if you go through that and, and you get the treatment you need. But I think it's really oversimplified to, to just put it on stigma. Um, stigma is a part of the problem, but we really got to look at this like patient navigation, okay? Because I meet plenty of veterans who do step forward and say, I'm going to have the courage to go get some help, and then it's not there. Either they can't find it because it's such a mess of opportunities, or when they finally do, the services fail them. Now, there are some great ones, um, but, but to oversimplify it and just say stigma, I think is, is too shallow. I think we've got to go deeper and understand the journey of the veteran. Um, you know, this week, all these vets that are here are focusing on ending the VA backlog. That is a, a huge issue when it comes to getting veterans who do step forward the benefits they've earned. 900,000 disability claims are backlogged right now. Um, new information came out last week that if, if you file your first claim, you're going to wait between 316 and 327 days. So let's say you have overcome that stigma. You go forward and you go to get care. And I'm going to focus on the VA right now because it needs focusing on. And, and our members continue to say that it needs focusing on. The wait time for veterans in New York and LA is over 600 days. We've got to fix this. This has to be a national priority. The president's got to get involved. And if he's serious about supporting our veterans, that's a great place to start. They've thrown more money at it. They've thrown more people at it. They've thrown more technology at it. And the backlog's going to go up to a million. So those are folks who have overcome that stigma and are being let down by the system. So all the veterans that are here this week are going to call on the president. We've had, we got a petition. We're going to bring it to the White House. And we're not going to stop until we achieve our goal, which is zero claims backlog. Zero veterans waiting for the care that they deserve. Jim, I, you know, I, I, think, I think stigma is, is still a serious issue. And, and I'm, I'm going to agree with, with, with Paul on, on one particular point, and, and that's, that's the culture, the military culture. Is, is really truly just not conducive to, to supporting um, uh, service members seeking mental health. And, and, and that's not to say that, that, the, that the military hasn't made fantastic strides, uh, because they have. They've made incredible strides. You've got an entire uh, resource center dedicated to research and, and developing best practices, defense centers of, of, uh, of excellence. Um, uh, you've got commanders that are going out on a daily basis talking to their, uh, their subordinates about the importance of seeking treatment. That never happened when I was in the Army, or probably not when you were in the Army either, it's Paul. True. It's true. Um, you know, so I think, I think the, 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 the Army gets it in the middle of service members, and right, is to continue that message from the command on down, uh, and sometimes that's what it takes from the command on down, uh, to say that it's okay. Um, and I also think that, that it requires resources. Um, uh, Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, both have increased uh, you know, budget, uh, their, their budgets and, uh, and expenditures on this issue. And it can't stop uh, because the bottom line is uh, the number of, of service members that are seeking treatment after they get out, now veterans, is increasing, right? So uh, last year, uh, or excuse me, it's, yeah, last year in October, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs issued, issued their report, uh, one in three, uh, about one in three Iraq and Afghanistan veterans uh, have filed for and, and received compensation for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, oh, it's o over 250,000 uh, service members. So, so that, that says two things. One, it says that, that veterans are now feeling more comfortable, right, coming to the VA and seeking treatment. Uh, but what it also says is, is the demand is going to grow and it's going to continue to grow. It has, has been growing and it's, and it's going to continue to grow. Uh, so to, in order to keep more, more veterans uh, involved in seeking treatment, we do need uh, to make sure that these programs continue uh, and that they're funded at appropriate levels um, and, that, and that people look at it as a, as a holistic community approach. Uh, and that, you know, that we take uh, important inputs and, and guidance you know, from our external partners. And then we also reach out to networks that are providing behavioral health services and, and work with them, right? I mean, that's the idea. The idea uh, is, is when any veteran uh, is addressing this issue, um, they see uh, an entire community standing ready to support them. Uh, that, in and of itself, can really affect the idea of stigma. I wanted to break down a couple of the points you guys are both making uh, about capacity, I guess. Uh, why, after a decade of war where lots of money has been poured into health care and into increasing the number of providers, why are there wait times? Why, why, what, are, what do we think about that? And why is that happening? Is it, are they not allocated correctly? Is, it, is there a general lack of uh, mental health providers in the population? What, what is going on there? Uh, well. 
and, and this ties back to, you know, I, I, again, I think that we, we have to be really creative and smart, and we need to each work where the space that makes sense for us to each work in. So Paul and his organization, it's really important to keep pushing on the VA to get it right and to make changes. That's going to take a long time. And even if it was fixed tomorrow, the VA and vet centers don't exist in every community. And so we have to look at community-based responses. And are there enough behavioral health providers out there? Well, there's probably about 400,000-ish of us out there. And are there, are there enough of each one of us to be given to each, mental, each veteran or service member that's in need? Probably not. But there's so much more that you can do with people like us, and that's given our. That's one of the things I love about my work is figuring out how to leverage our professionals so that they give information to others in the community because not everybody needs or wants or will ever want to see somebody like me. Um, it's not going to fit for them, or it's not going to make sense, or that may not be what they need. But here's a problem that's not talked about very often. You know, there's, there's a lot of turf issues in communities with nonprofits. It's not just the DOD and DOD, DOD and the VA that doesn't necessarily like to work with others. A lot of our own groups, uh, which is frustrating and, and frankly at times irritating. So folks, if, if you come in to see somebody, um, I'm gonna pick on Blue Star <laughs> Families because I know that you guys are, do, do share. If somebody comes in to see Blue Star Families, and Blue Star Families can't provide what they need in that community, Blue Star Families better darn well know who else in their own community and share that information. And that, we're not doing that. So, so we can talk about the problems in the VA, and Lord knows there are many, and we can talk about where DOD is moving and what else needs to happen, but I don't want to let us off the hook either, that in the community um, we have work to do so that we're doing a better job in each community connecting those dots and working together. We're not there yet, there are some efforts, but, and some of that, to, and I'll say this to the funders in the room, some of that is because there's a, there's, you know, we all get very scared about, oh my gosh, we need to make sure we have, we've maintained our funding, and if I talk about a good effort over here with Blue Star Families, you're gonna fund them and not me, I can't do that. So it's complicated, but we need to talk about that piece of it too, because that's there. That's a good issue. We should come back to that. Any of you guys want to talk about capacity and what's going on yeah. there? I think, you know, the VA has no shortage of resources at this point. And, and all the veterans groups in this room fought hard for advanced funding and for adequate funding. So funding's not an issue. Now it's a matter of leadership and getting the job done. Um, but I think we also have to appreciate that uh, the capacity is not the same in the private sector. Okay, there is an explosion of public health demand that's not being met by community-based nonprofits because they don't have the resources, by our local hospital systems because they don't have the resources. You've got two and a half million people who've come home from war, and many of them have health issues. And the comparison that I sometimes draw is with the explosion of public health needs around AIDS called three decades ago. You had this new issue that exploded across America, and most of the country didn't feel it. They thought it was somebody else's problem, and they thought that AIDS was a gay issue in the same way the general public thinks that veterans are a military issue. Okay? Then you had no efficacy standards, uh, you had no metrics, you had no best in class, um, and you really had a shortage of philanthropic investment. So you're trying to help literally millions of people uh, with a very small piece of the pie. Um, if you look at research, you know, I see Terry's in the room here from RAND. I mean, RAND wrote the definitive study on this, on this issue, it was four years ago, and it needs to be updated. There needs to be tremendous research in this space just to identify the problems before we even start talking about programs that can meet them. So, you know, we continue to issue a national call to say that we're really, people think that it's like the Haiti Fund or, or like after Katrina where there are these uh, Bill Clinton and, and George Bush super funds where there's hundreds of millions of dollars flying around for veterans charities and that's not the case. Um, you know, Barbara should have what she needs. All the other groups in this room should have what they need because it's literally a matter of life and death. So I think we have had a good conversation in this town about resources, but it hasn't gone broad yet and that, that needs to start happening now. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think um, it's, no, it's no secret that there's a behavioral health care provider shortage uh, in, in, in the country. And, um, you know, when, when you start from that dynamic, the question is, is you know, how do you, how do you build capacity in a timely fashion? 
uh, into an, or in order to address a need right now. And I think um, you know we do we need, we we need to think about how you invest in research and how you invest in education. So um, you know I, I I really like the idea um, uh, of of veterans uh, going to school and pursuing the behavioral health care degrees or some sort of behavioral health care training. And Barbara's got some really interesting ideas about that. And I you know I think. Uh, the, the idea of actually ramping up uh, the capacity of behavioral health care providers and even non-medical behavioral health care providers because you have to remember that the, 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 the scale and scope of behavioral health care is pretty wide, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, highly intensive, uh, you know, inpatient therapy all the way down to me and Paul going around the corner and drink a beer and, and just talk about, you know, our war experiences, right? That's the behavioral health scale. Uh, there's so much that can be done on, on, on the low medical side of behavioral health to help address this issue in terms of capacity. But I also agree with, with Paul when he talks about resources. Um, those kinds of ideas, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, counseling, and services, uh, leveraging uh, federal dollars to improve resources for local community nonprofits that are providing behavioral health care support, those kinds of ideas need to start rising to the top because the bottom line is, um, you know, in, 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 in the white paper, Sea of Goodwill, that, that came out of the chairman's office in 2009, he said something very, very interesting, and, and, and I think people are just now kind of getting it. We can't do it alone. It's going to require the community. It's going to require the community who's receiving these veterans and military family members to step up to the plate and, and meet the Department of Defense, meet the Department of Veterans Affairs, and meet other federal agencies and state agencies and organizations at the table to work together to address this issue. Um, so capacity is an issue. Uh, but can it be addressed? I think it absolutely can be addressed uh, if you look at where the need is and if people just start coming to the table. So you raise an interesting question about whether, whether veterans should be trained to do some of this. And, and, and you've all talked about peer-to-peer -peer, uh, counseling and that sort of work. How important is that sort of peer-to-peer -peer counseling? Uh, and does it, how much of a difference does it make in improving care, do you think, and why? I, it's a huge part of it and an exciting part of, of where um, this whole effort is heading. Um, here's a great you know, recent example. So one of our partners we work with is Team Rubicon. Great organization that they go out in response to disasters and they pull in a bunch of the other partners in this room to do this great work. And we've been talking to them for quite a while um, about the concept of our providers providing behavioral health um, mentoring and training so that their folks who are interested learn, you know, mental health first aid, learn how to identify in their peers that something is going on, get that person, if needed, to somebody who's a level above them in terms of their training or expertise. So we've been talking about that, but it wasn't until Hurricane Sandy hit, Team Rubicon went out and send a bunch of folks into the community. Well, what happened? Well, those of us in the mental health field would not be surprised. A lot of the men and women who went out on those disasters, it stirred them up. Um, it caused difficulties for them psychologically. Totally makes sense in two different interesting areas. So now we're getting into the nitty gritty of sort of what we see. One was folks who had experienced trauma, they go into these areas that are disasters, stirs up their own trauma, you know, and they start having nightmares and reactions. It's totally normal, but they have to be able to talk and process. The other thing that happened, and this is very true for so many of our, our veterans, many of these men and women who went into this disaster again felt a sense of purpose, and a sense of, of, of honor to serve their country, their communities. When they came out of that, what they started talking about is, I don't have that in my life. Mm -hmm. I work in a job where I am underemployed. I've got nothing, and they, depression started to emerge. They had some really scary posts on their face Facebook pages, people saying, that's it, I got nothing else, I don't want to do anything else. If I can't do something like this, I'm, you know, I'm out of here. And so that, that experience led Team Rubicon and I to sit down and to really start to craft specifically. Now again, to Paul's point, to Kobe's, we need resources. So now we have this beautiful proposal that's like, okay, here's what we could do and here's how we would create this peer base, but without resources, we can't do it. But we've seen it over and over and over and over again, the power, the importance. It doesn't take the place of the mental health professionals who've had years of training, years of experience, years of expertise. But as Kobe said, which is exactly right, that is a, it's a continuum of behavioral health care. So if we can bring in, and by the way, while we're at it, and this is one of the things that we're very involved in, training the next generation of mental health folks, if we can encourage veterans who are out there who have an interest now in learning this, 
get them into schools, get them into programs, all the better. But we we got to do both at the same time because we can't wait for a whole wave of veterans in a few years. We we need them now, but we can do both at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we we say this: the problem is a solution. If you invest in the veterans, they will solve these challenges. We always talk about our model is an acronym we call HEEC, Health, Education, Employment, and Community. If you empower veterans to be health care workers, they will reach out to other veterans and help lower the suicide rate and get people involved. If you invest in veterans in the area of employment, if you give them opportunities to create small businesses and to be leaders, they will lower the unemployment rate. If you give them a GI Bill that works, they will go to school and do well in education. And in communities, if you invest in them, they will change communities. So there's a tremendous entrepreneurial streak that exists within this generation. Um, people say to me that they're surprised when they hear that young veterans are entrepreneurial. They think that we're robots and we just follow orders and nothing else. But if you've been on a, a remote checkpoint in Afghanistan for a couple weeks with limited resources and limited guidance and high stress, you get entrepreneurial real fast. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of person you want in your local business. However, the thing that's missing in this, in this entire equation is not just investment, but the capacity for scale. There are a lot of great nonprofit ideas at the local level. I meet veterans all the time who are creating their own nonprofits, but there's no pathway to scale. And that's where groups like Aspen and others in the thought leadership space can create programs that allow the best ideas to blow up. Right? We're not just going to be the next security guard. We could be the next Mark Zuckerberg. And that's the framework we've got to start to get people to think about. Because every time I meet a veteran who starts a business, the first thing they ask me is, where can I hire more veterans? Uh, and they're going to go on to do great things, just like every other generation in this country has done. But we've got to think about not just the resources, but the scale and the path to scale. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think um, uh, the the idea, and, and we're lucky to have uh, you know one of our one of our programs, Cat Convet Corps, here today with us. And um, you know, the 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 idea uh, there was was really to uh, place uh, veterans using AmeriCorps members, place veterans who are AmeriCorps members co-locate them in National Guard units that deal with substance abuse issues on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Millennium Cohort Study in uh, 2012 um, uh, basically uh, you know, said, you know, we've got a guard community in crisis. 22% uh, of guardsmen and, uh, and reservists uh, have a behavioral health uh, or substance use problem. 26% uh, or more uh, have difficulties uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with, with their economic state. Um, and to be completely honest with you, the National Guard uh, didn't have a ton of resources to address that issue. Uh, so they came to us uh, in 2012, and we funded uh, a grant um, to co-locate AmeriCorps members who are also veterans, to the, for the most part, uh, to work with the behavioral health counselors in the National Guard units and to help them scale uh, their, own their own community capacity. And so when Paul talks about scale, a big part of scale, to be completely honest with you, with, with nonprofits, is this human capital. Right? Uh, is bodies. Uh, how can I get a full-time person to focus mm -hmm. on this particular issue and I don't have to pay them a ton? Or, if they're an AmeriCorps member, heck, I don't have to pay them at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, AmeriCorps will pay them for us and, and, and they'll do amazing work. And they'll go in, they'll work their 1,700 hours for an entire year for that nonprofit and they'll go into that job mission-oriented, mission-focused, knowing they've only got a year to get that job done. And I'm proud to say right now we've got, uh, we've got CAD Cabet Corps members working in over 23 23 guardians, we got two here today. We're uh, in the back somewhere. You know, oh, oh, in, over, in over 23 states. And that happened, you want to talk about scale. That happened in, in, the, in a matter of nine months. And so, you know, those are the kinds of ideas of leveraging human capital resources, investing in nonprofits in, in the local levels, and investing in, in state based organizations and entities. National Guard is very localized. Uh, in, investing in those kind of very local, community driven solutions to address this issue, um, you know, with veterans, by veterans, and for veterans. Uh, can be very impactful. Just w one thing I'll add is I think the training component is really important. Mm. Um, a lot of veterans feel more comfortable going to vet centers because they're run by veterans and talking to other veterans, um, but nothing takes the place of good, good training. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's important to keep in mind that you know for, for veterans or service members, sometimes they feel like they can only talk to somebody who's experienced the same problems that they have, um, but that that person may not be able to help them in the way that somebody else who maybe wasn't a service member or wasn't a veteran uh, who's been highly trained you know, for several years to treat that particular problem. So I, I think peer-to-peer um, -peer is obviously critically important. Um, it's, for us, outreach is all service members, all veterans, our outreach team, and we hire as many service members and veterans as we can. Um, 
but sometimes um, just talking to other veterans can get in the way of people getting the help that they really need. So I just kind of want to throw it out there that um, that. Sometimes, it's, sometimes I've heard it used as a justification for not getting the help they need, saying I would go to the VA, yeah. but they don't understand me. They're not, they're not a veteran. They're not a service member. They haven't been through what, what I've been through. Mm -hmm. Well, you're all pushing up against the big issue of well, how, do, how do you organize this? How, how do you organize resources? How do you allocate them in a smart way? Um, out of the 45,000 or however many volunteer groups out there serving veterans, how do you how do you try to direct veterans to the most effective ones? Or how do you direct money to the most effective ones? Um, and I'm interested in getting all your thoughts on that. Uh, Mike, Mike Haney from Syracuse has recently put out this concept of a national veterans strategy where he's talking about maybe we should have an office in the executive branch that helps coordinate all these things. Is that? Is that the right way to go, or is or is it is should it be more decentralized? Should it all be out of communities and bubbling up? What, 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 how do you begin making this work? Uh, I think Mike Haney hit on an important point, and and I encourage everybody to read his paper. There are something like eight different government agencies that are responsible for veterans, so no one is really responsible for all of it, and and being kind of the umbrella to capture it. So his recommendation was that we create a national veteran strategy because we don't have one right now. Um, and you've got a patchwork immersion, uh, emergence of, of things trying to happen. Um, you know, some of it is, is going to be the market forces dictating. I mean, you've got a new space it, that really kind of exploded in the last decade, but you've seen best in class start to emerge. And, and there are tools out there ranging from, you know, Charity Navigator to Robinhood to Aspen to the Blueprint. Um, there are probably less than a dozen now that can serve as validators to help you understand what make up the best in class. So, you know, I hear from a lot of folks, I heard from a, a leader in finance recently who said to me, you know, there are so many nonprofits, I don't know where to start. If I came in with a tech company, he wouldn't tell me that. Right? You can, you can figure out ways to analyze effectiveness, and, and I think that's a cop-out. Okay, to say there are too many and we don't know where to start, there are plenty of them that have been working for a long time, that have been well vetted, that have, you know, documented success. Um, if you want to use that as your excuse, fine, but, but understand that, that they are well documented. Um, the, the Iraq and Afghanistan Deployment Impact Fund uh, pushed $250 million into this space. Now, you can argue you don't like their methodology, but many of them did emerge as a best in class. Robinhood has gone through this similar exercise in New York to try to figure out how to stitch them all together. Uh, and it's been you know, investing in us uh, in part to create what's really needed, which is what we call a, uh, the RIP program, Rapid Response Referral Program. Veterans call up and they don't know where to go. They have a bunch of problems. And who do they come to? They come to us. Um, so we've got caseworkers who answer the phone and try to unpack their problems. If they're suicidal, we connect them with the Veterans Crisis Line at the VA. If they need a job, we connect them with jobs programs. If their claim is backlog, we work it through that. Um, and then we deliver them to service providers who have been funded by Robinhood. Because you can't just deliver a warm handoff to someone who doesn't have the capacity to, to handle it. And that's what often happens, is you hand a vet off to someone and they drop off the table. Right. And there's no accountability in making sure that they report back to you. So I think it, there are some examples out there, and Aspen's done a great job also of clarifying that. Um, but some of us have been in the space for 10 years. And, and we've been knocking down important barriers. Uh, and and uh, we also know who the other folks are. And one of the most important things I'd ask you to look for is cultural competency. Do, do you understand the space? And do you understand this new generation in this space. Because you've been serving veterans for 35 years, doesn't mean you can serve a single mom who's 19 years old who just got back from Afghanistan. It's a very different problem set. Um, so I encourage folks to think about that cultural competency and, and look for leaders who come from this generation. You've got to speak their language, you've got to understand their needs, and when it comes down to it, ask the vets. If they've got a program that's serving vets, ask them for the vets. And not just a PowerPoint slide that shows Johnny the vet who's happy now, but, but look for metrics. And, and talk to the customers who are served by those, by those programs. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, the, the idea of, of, uh, of you know, selecting or, or choosing or identifying uh, you know, the, the, the best, best practices to work with and collaborate, it, it's an important issue, um, mostly because you know, this, is, uh, this is an important community to our country. Um, you know, uh, when Secretary Shinseki and the President talk about, about veterans, they, they talk about it being a solemn obligation. Um, and, and it is, it is a solemn obligation. It's, it's a different kind of, of, of obligation. And, um, you know, so, so we do want to make sure that we're very careful in, in terms of, 
uh, the kinds of organizations that, that, that we push and direct our, our veteran military family community to. Um, you know, Harris Wofford, a former senator from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, was, was one of the, the, the anchors of, uh, of the Serve America Act uh, that, that created AmeriCorps. Uh, and of course, um, you know, worked very closely with Sergeant Shriver in, in the development of Peace Corps. And most people don't know this, but, but he was a World War II veteran, uh, Army Air Corps. And um, when, when, I, when I first came to this position, I, I, I spoke with him a little bit about that. And he said, you know, um, what, makes Amer what makes the idea of AmeriCorps great is not the idea of, of federal dollars getting pushed down in, into the community and having the community develop those resources. Um, th that's, that's a big part of it. But the biggest part of the idea is, is now we can draw the string. Now I can draw the string from uh, the federal budget appropriations for fiscal year XYZ all the way down to Kayla Harris, who's a CADCA Vet Corps member, serving 15 different people in a week uh, in, in, uh, in Lubbock, Texas. Right? I, now I can draw the string. And the reason I can draw the string is because the way the design of the program is, is we put out a grant competition every year, or we put out two or three. It really depends. Uh, the grant competition goes out, and, and we define very broad parameters of activities of support. And they're always aligned with the, the current strategic priorities um, you know, the, uh, you know, that the veteran military family communities are facing you know, based upon our research. And uh, that, that scope of activities, those, those grant programs go down to the communities, and the communities design the solutions. And the communities say, We're gonna, we are going to counsel uh, 2,000 military family members on, on how to connect and better utilize, uh, or excuse me, how to connect with employment resources and to better utilize their volunteer experience in their resumes. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do that with 1,500 uh, military spouses in, in a year, uh, and we're gonna connect uh, you know 10,000 veterans with it, with uh, you know with behavioral health counseling support services, uh, and th and that report comes up and it comes up to us and we look at it every year and we say did you did you or did you not meet your objectives, and that's pretty much the extent of the federal involvement in that process. Define the wide parameters, give it to community, have the community develop the solutions, and then report back the, the progress and the, and the support. So, you know, over, like I, said, I mentioned earlier, 2,000, we did that with 2,000 nonprofits last year. Um, uh, there have been over 20,000 nonprofits that we've supported since the corporation came into existence. That's a big number. It ain't 64,000 or whatever the number of veteran military family organizations that are out there today. I'm not sure what the number is, but it's a large number. And if you invest in solutions like that, you are going to be able to, to drive results driven oriented, uh, you know, uh, results driven solutions, and you're going to be able to report on them, and you're going to be able to connect all of those communities with human capital resources, and that, that's one way to get it together, and that's also one way to get it together and, and report out, uh, you know, metrics and successes. Uh, uh, you know, this, the, I'm an optimist and I'm an idealist, otherwise I wouldn't have, you know, started a nonprofit when I had a very fine career going, because <laughs> um, it's hard work, and to make it work and to make it successful is hard work, and um, the idea of having a national office that does that is sort of a wonderful concept, but I, I think that there are going to be a lot of obstacles and roadblocks to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So even though the concept might be great, what I would say is there's a whole lot we can take from that wonderful report, and I agree, it's very, it's academically, it's very sound, very solid, a lot of great things in there, but let's take that and put it at the community level, because that's where we're more likely going to actually be able to see community efforts, and to the points that you've heard, there are models now that are out there. And as I often say, when I'm sitting before a group of community leaders who are going, well, we could go A, we could go B, we could go C, I'm like, pick one. I don't care. <laughs> Try it. And do your homework, do your due diligence, bring in your, your team. You're, you're, you're not looking for the one and only model. You're looking for a model, an example. And there are now lots out here that you could pick from that are sound. There are good collaborative efforts, good programs. So I, I like the concept, but I just I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime, um, or at least not in the next few years. And so in the meantime, I would encourage folks to, again, you know, be the catalyst in your own space and start going, OK. And back to my point earlier, um, we, we need to do a better job of playing well in the sandbox together. VA, DOD, nonprofits, um, you know, that's a human issue. We were talking about mental health as a human issue. Well, this is one too. We, we get competitive or we get scared or we get focused on turf and we, you know, and, and so those of us who then find ourselves in positions of influence or 
status or whatever you want to call it, it's really on us to model. It's leadership. It's stepping up and saying, I, I want to do this as a collaborative. Force other groups, if you can, um, by sort of goodwill. Um, encourage those who maybe are falling by the wayside to do things differently. There's a lot of things we can all do that um, we too often get very narrow in, you know, raising our own organization status. And, and I think in this space, as we've heard up here, these are complex, complicated situations for these men and women and their families. And we really got to do a little bit better at accepting that uh, on an individual organization level, too. Yeah, and, a, and a national group with no authority is meaningless. I mean, it, they, they would have to have the authority to execute. I mean, you know, I'm kind of struck by a lot of these plans. The Dole Shalala report is still out there. I mean, the Dole Shalala report happened after the Walter Reed scandal, and there are plenty of the issues that are still left unresolved that were revealed in that report. So, you know, I get a bit frustrated because I feel like we're reanalyzing the problem over and over again. We generally know, you know, what the problems are. The question are, is now what are the solutions and what are the solutions that can get to scale? That's where the ideas are, and that's where I think Aspen and other thought leaders can push the conversation. Uh, I'm tired of going to panels explaining what PTSD is. I mean, we generally know now. Um, you know, now the question is who can actually deal with it and, and, and who can show points on the board. That's where I think the conversation's got to evolve to. Yeah. Well, and, and so um, let's talk a moment about the, the public and private aspects of that. Um, your sandbox, uh, there's, there's lots of pretty small players, and then there's VA, I guess, in that sandbox. And, and, and so maybe the conversation starts there. How, how do you, can you work with VA? How do, how do nonprofits, private corporations, independent groups work with VA? Is VA good in the sandbox? Is it friendly? Uh, or it do, what does it need to do to get better at playing with everybody else in there? I think we should ask our viewers. <laughs> <laughs> because we can talk about what our experience is. Oh, from Kobe, you have to be trying to avoid those questions. <laughs> Some of these questions are a little bit above my pay grade. As a VA <laughs> so I can't speak on behalf of, of the VA, but yeah, I, so. I think it's, I mean, I, I do think it's incumbent on us as VA employees to reach out and work with people and trying to, you know, I, I, I mentioned, you know, trying to disseminate programs um, with groups like Blue Shield or, or others, trying to work with those in the community. Um, to reach out out beyond the VA and not expecting everybody to to, to come in to see you. Um, so I think I mean from our sorry to put you on the spot, okay. <laughs> but but we often on the outside have one experience of whether in our again you know the VA is not one person, uh, even though we might like to look at um, General S Secretary Shinseki and say you know you fix it now. He's he's one very important person in that system, but what we find is again, it's, it's, it's got to be leadership. It's, the message has to get down to the folks who often want to coordinate with us, but they don't think they're supposed to or that they're allowed to. And so I don't, I don't think yet the culture has shifted quite yet so that it is the culture that the VA works collaboratively in communities. But can we find people? Absolutely. I know many of them. Um, we have an MOA with the a piece of the VA, and that's the other thing. Isn't it interesting that we have a memorandum of agreement with the um, uh, crisis line? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's fine. But it, it, we want it to be broader in terms of that the, we want all the different parts of the VA wherever to work collaboratively because we're there to help. Um, we're, and so I think that's our experience anyway, that it is a hit or miss not yet culturally consistent internal to the VA and so we still are you know recreating the, the wheel in communities going it's okay you really can't work with us that's what we see not there yet but better than it was eight years ago mm. yeah, I mean it's, it's a very it depends on where you sit quality of care at VA is very high when we ask our members how do you feel about the quality of care they feel it's it's good and we want VA to succeed and we encourage our members to seek out VA care however we also are grounded in the reality that if you live in New York or Los Angeles, you're going to wait for 600 days. That's the reality. So I think we are a good example. We have a great partnership with the Veterans Crisis Line. If we get a suicidal veteran, we pass them over through a warm handoff. We have a, a working relationship with the Veterans Crisis Line. We have outreach folks come into our, our headquarters office in New York, which has been especially important recently because the Manhattan VA is still closed after Hurricane Sandy. 
Um, that hospital is, is, is starting to reopen now, but many patients are going from Staten Island to the Bronx and all over the five boroughs. So it, it really depends on where you sit. And the most important person to ask that question is the veteran. And because that is the interaction that more veterans have with the U.S. government, with their country, really than anything else. About 54% of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have used the VA. Only 54%. So the question is, why haven't the others? And where are they going? Sometimes it's to Barbara. Sometimes it's to us. Sometimes it's to other groups in the room. But consistently, we see that VA is not doing a good enough job in meeting the basic needs for access that these folks in this room require. Whether it's late GI Bill checks or waiting 600 days for a disability claim, you've got to meet what the customer wants, especially in this generation that's technology focused and expects you to deliver. And if you don't deliver, they don't come back. My Facebook page all week as we focused on the backlog said, you know what, I went and I tried and I gave up. And we don't know how many people out there are like that. I encourage them not to give up and we will do all we can to make sure they don't give up. But we've got to be grounded, especially in this town, with an understanding of what those men and women and their families are facing every day. Because in some cities, it's just absurd. Nobody in this country should be comfortable with the fact that veterans are waiting 600 days. It's, it's 2013. Like, that is just ridiculous. Do you want anything? Yeah, Jim. So, so um, since, since we're here and everybody's talking about the veteran crisis line, so uh, the, the number is 1-800-273-8255. So I think everybody, uh, you know, write that down, uh, pin it, stick it on your on your uh, on your refrigerator, just have it, put it in your pocket, keep it with you. 273-8255. Uh, um, but you know, to, Jim, Jim, to your point about uh, about collaboration and, and the difficulty with with collaborating, right? Um, federal agencies aren't are bureaucracies. And, and I can talk a little bit about it because uh, my federal agency, that's all we do is work with nonprofits uh, and, and state agencies. We're actually designed to do that. So uh, the, the, the design of the corporation is to work with nonprofit organizations and state aid entities that provide social service support. Um, that, that's our mission. Other federal agencies, that's not their mission. Uh, they've got other missions. Um, and and uh, community collaboration uh, becomes a part of, you know, of those missions. And a lot of it is, is honestly, is dictated uh, by ethics rules and regulations, about non-endorsement issues. Uh, and it becomes very legalistic in a lot of ways. And any time you bring in a lawyer, and I can say it's because uh, I, I, I got my law degree a little <laughs> while ago, uh, is, is not necessarily a good idea. <laughs> um, uh, it will definitely slow things down. But the bottom line is uh, you're not going to get a federal agency to work with, with a nonprofit organization without having at least one lawyer in the room at some point in time. Right. Um, so so, so it, it is difficult to work with federal agencies uh, without a doubt. They're not necessarily designed to work in a collaborative nature with nonprofits for a lot of different reasons. Um, but there are ways to get it done. Uh, and, and if you are persistent about it and if you're collaborative about it, uh, you know, there are MOUs, there are interagency agreements, there are granting opportunities, there are other ways to work with federal agencies in, in a collaborative way to get, to, to get things done. And uh, there are also federal innovators. Uh, there are people in federal agencies uh, that are, are looking at these issues and they're, and they're willing to, to put their careers and their reputations on the line uh, to do innovative thinking uh, and, and, and to start moving organizations that are, are stoic and very bureaucratic in different organizations. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, you know, uh, Army for Life back there. Didn't exist last year. Very innovative program. A very collaborative program with uh, with nonprofit with the nonprofit sector. Um, so there are innovators in federal agencies, and I would just encourage the nonprofits that are listening find those innovators in those agencies and use them as your leverage point to get into those organizations uh, and get the discussion going. Um, and then also, I would encourage you know this audience and others to encourage other federal agencies to work together themselves. <laughs> uh, you know, because sometimes we don't do a fantastic job of, of collaboration. Um, and, uh, and working together to, to help solve problems. And if we can't work together, it makes it difficult to work with other nonprofit organizations as well. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, in defense of, of federal agencies of where I work, um, we want to collaborate. You know, we want to work with the local communities uh, and nonprofit leaders in order to address these issues. Um, and and we're here, we're, we, we've got an open door policy. I've got an open door policy. Uh, if you guys want to talk about collaboration, come to me, uh, and I'm, I'm more than willing to talk about it. We should uh, open up the floor for questions from the audience if uh, anybody would, has any. Sir? Oh, you want to speak in the microphone? You, sir. I was in the service during Vietnam, and although the educational benefits were wonderful, this just sounds like, quote Yogi Berra, this is deja vu all over. The Veterans Administration is at backlogs on Agent Orange and, and post traumatic stress syndrome, even with Vietnam vets. And the 600 pound gorilla in the room is the Veterans Administration. Why, as a country, do we have to have people that are volunteering in nonprofits take care of our veterans? I think that's an absolute outrage that there's as much 
to silence on in the press, and that something needs to be done about it. A really crazy idea would be fire 20% of the veterans administration and replace them with Iraq and Afghanistan vets, and I bet you would see an overnight improvement. <laughs> Well, the one, one thing I'll, I'll address is a piece of what you said, because it, it is important to have it out there, which is um, uh, why should people volunteer to give their time in addition to fixing the VA? I hope we never prevent or never <coughs> stop asking the civilian mental health professionals in communities to step up and give, because um, it's part of the conversation that we need to have in America that these are our veterans, our service members, and by the way, our civilian mental health professionals so value the opportunity to serve. So I would say you're right about we need to do some major overhauling and fixing the problems internally, but I'll go back to what I have, will continue to because we keep seeing it, which is it has to be a collaborative. It can't ever be. The VA could, even if it really wanted to, I can't even imagine, and, then I, and I don't believe that that would be the best solution. It should run effectively and efficiently and do what it's supposed to do, and then we should also have our communities involved on both sides. That, that's what I would say to that piece. Yeah, I, I would say um, it's, it's important for our community to be engaged in our, with, with our veterans and military families. This is, this is an American response. It's an American responsibility. All Americans have a responsibility to take care of returning service men, men and women in uniform and their family members. Um, and, you know, I would also say that, that uh, you know, you're talking about a federal budget of $140 billion-ish or so for the Department of Veterans Affairs, which, oh, by the way, uh, has been a dramatic increase from when I was there in 1998 uh, by almost $40 billion. So 25% increase. I don't think there's really been any president in the past 35 years that's, that's made that kind of commitment to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, so the, the will to get it done, no <coughs> doubt, is there. As a matter of fact, that's, that's actually true. There hasn't been a president. That's, that's increased the budget for the Department of Veterans Affairs more than President Obama has. So I think there's a commitment in this administration to assist. Um, and, and I know uh, there's, there's a will to assist. Um, but you're also talking about uh, a problem that is, is, is growing every day. And I agree that it's not necessarily within uh, the, uh, the ability of the federal government writ large to address this issue. Uh, I think it has to be a community-based approach. Um, Brown University just issued a study, the Cost of War Study. $2.2 trillion uh, to include the cost of, of caring for our, our veterans and military family members. Um, uh, that has to be uh, a community-based response. Somebody, somebody has to step up to the table and say, as a community, we're going to address this issue. As, as a community, we're going to come together and take care of our veterans and military family members. Uh, and to be completely honest with you, uh, I don't think anybody anticipated uh, you know, that that would be the cost of $2.2 trillion. Linda Bilmes wrote a book in 2008 that it was going to be $3 trillion. Uh, cost of war. Uh, so these are tremendous costs. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs clearly has the ultimate responsibility uh, in the federal government for addressing these issues, and I think they take it very seriously. But failing to plan is planning to fail. Do people in this town really not think veterans were going to come home from the wars? I mean, it, it's just, it's striking to me, and one thing we want to do is try to put a human face on it. Because you hear numbers, you hear dollar amounts, and all week and all year, IAVA is going to continue to put a human face on the backlog. That's very important. And, and Zach, I'm going to call you out, but like Zach, Zach McElwain is here. He's an Army vet who, served, who did two tours in Iraq, and he's been waiting three years for his disability claim. Three years. I mean, that's why he's here in Washington this week, is to give voice to him and his family and so many other folks that are waiting. And maybe I'll shift a little bit and make sure this is not just a, a, a downer, bummer type of thing. There's also great stuff happening. The GI Bill has been totally transformative. And Zach's here too, but if you're a veteran in the room who's used the post 9-11 GI Bill, raise your hand. That also happened, right? And they've graduated. Hundreds of thousands of them have now graduated and they're coming out in the workforce and the GI Bill, the post 9-11 GI Bill, has been a total game changer. Uh, $7 will return to the national economy for every dollar invested on the original GI Bill. Senator Webb, when he was fighting for it with Senator Warner and others, famously said, no dollar is wasted that goes into a veteran's head. And, and that's what we've seen, is these folks now represent a tremendous <coughs> opportunity for this country. So I, I know that, that folks in this town get beat up a lot, but there were plenty of folks who also told us the GI Bill was too expensive. It was a partisan year, and you guys covered this back in the day. We heard the president might veto it. But ultimately, it got through. We expanded it to vocational schools. It, it still has some hiccups. But if anybody is out there watching, you know, the GI Bill is awesome. Use it. You earned it. 
and it'll probably change the life and, and the life of your family. Can I also just say, uh, I, having spoken to a lot of VA, frontline VA employees, I, I can tell you a lot of them are about as frustrated, not quite as frustrated as the veterans, but a lot of them are deeply frustrated by, and I don't think it's for lack of effort on their parts or desire. It, it's, there's, there's something horribly wrong with that, the whole bureaucracy. Yes, my name is uh, Ron Slipto, and I'd like to well, thank the panel. Um, and uh, particularly, I wanted like to uh, thank the Aspen Institute for pulling us together. Uh, Dr. Uh, Van Dalen, uh, we've Hello. our names have been crossing for the past three and four years. Uh, yes. Paul, uh, I know our names, and Kobe. Um, it's about innovation. It's about how do we work together, not from a not, not only from a nonprofit perspective, but innovators and companies out such as mine. How do we work collaboratively together with government entities to bring solutions to the table? Uh, we're currently right now uh, have the training program uh, at Walter Reed, also Fort Hood, Texas. We're training healthcare providers on PTSD, TBI, cultural competency, military culture. We have an MOU with the American Academy of um, Physician Assistants. We just launched our training at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. The key thing is how do we now work together with the innovators in the field looking at solutions? How do we work with the non uh, nonprofits that are out there to see how do we bring all this together? Because as uh, Barbara said, it's about collaboration. If we continue with this turf war in reference to, I go it this way, I have these silos, we're never going to get anywhere. This is warfare. People are dying every single day. Real deaths. And we as a nation, it is all our responsibility to figure out how we work together, how we break down the barriers, and how we continue to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. So I appreciate your leadership, continue to good work. Aspen Institute, thank you for allowing me the opportunity because, again, these are some of the great people doing great work, and this is one of the first opportunities I've had a chance to meet them together. So Aspen Institute, great job. I just pointed at Renee. Uh, thank you. This, Renee Campos with the Military Officers Association of America. Um, I appreciate your comment, uh, uh, Kobe, but I, I also f um, believe that there is a a responsibility for both DOD and VA to take on um, the, the responsibilities of these folks coming back. We have spent a dec over a decade now of trying to make these two systems, uh, DOD and VA, to be seamless. And there's still, in both agencies, a, a desire to hide behind HIPAA or, and I appreciate the VA and, and DOD working hard to get the, uh, you know, electronic medical record and all that. And, um, but I guess my question would be to, um, to, to VA, but others on the panel, um, we need to do a better job of these folks leaving the military before they leave the military. We are diagnosing them with these things. Um, there doesn't seem to be a real reason why we can't do that warm handoff to VA and not just warm and drop them, but I just can't help but think there's still a lot more work that needs to be done there. And we tend to think, okay, now they're in the VA, but you know what? Some of these people who are severely, uh, who leave with, um, you know, with a, uh, uh, a medical Ability. Uh, they're going to move back and forth between these systems, and if we don't get this right, so how do we do that? How do we, we can't just focus on the outside agencies, we have to focus on these two agencies, so I'd be interested in your thoughts. So the question of a, a warm handoff, it sounds like what you're suggesting is DOD needs to do more in terms of um, kind of preparing people from going into the civilian world or going into the VA. Um, so I could tell you as a clinician who works with veterans, returning service members, um, a big part of my job is trying to help kind of um, reverse, uh, reverse training um, that, that people have been through, their military training, or what has worked for them in a military context. They go into the civilian world and it doesn't really work very well anymore. Um, so I, I think it's a very difficult thing and when I work with service members and veterans who are trying to manage their anger better, trying to get hold of control of PTSD, um, trying to respond to situations without assuming that, that the other person is going to do harm to them in some way, um, and then they get redeployed, um, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Um, so, it's, so they come back and in a way we're trying to get them prepared for the civilian world and then they're going back and forth between DOD and, and VA and it's, it is 
very difficult. So I can't really speak to the, the DOD and what they should be doing exactly to train folks because the other, other people on the panel probably know better what the DOD does right now. I mean, I go to Yellow Ribbon events and Strong, bond ev strong Bonds events, and I teach classes on how to communicate better and how to manage anger and all of that sort of thing. But that's kind of down the road, kind of when folks are already back. I would just echo, you know, you're right, DOD has to be the player in the room every single time we mention BA. They know that. Um, I think we've seen that DOD has been forced to innovate because they're at war um, in a way that's kind of changed the culture there in a way that I don't think is reverberated through VA. Not to say that they are by any means in, in, a, in a good enough spot, um, but I think if you look at, you know, the virtual electronic record that um, the president announced with DOD and VA, I think it was 2009, they invested half a, half a billion dollars in it, and they scrapped it. You know, they spiked the ball before they crossed the goal line, had a big press conference, and a couple weeks ago stood before comments, co Congress and said they're scrapping it. So uh, we know there has to be that, that seamless handoff because they do kind of fall off the edge when they come out of the military. I'm optimistic that, that Secretary Hagel can help change the understanding as a combat veteran himself, as someone who's worked at the VA, uh, as someone who's seen all sides of this, I hope that he can help drive some of that transformation and create a better uh, collaboration between the VA and the DOD. We're hoping to meet with him later this week so he can hear from some of these folks. But um, you know, the bottom line is the DOD really is the last point where we all have them, right? They have them. And then most civilians think that there's some big master list of veterans in the sky <laughs> that we can just call up and say, hey, call all the vets in Cincinnati and tell them to go to whatever. But, but that, that database doesn't exist. And I think that's the area I would focus on, is how do we create data and how do we extend that string from the time they enlist until the time they die? How do you keep track of them all the way through so we can understand the health effects, understand the gaps, and design programs to effectively meet their needs? Right. And that, um, Renee, point, you know, I, I mean, I was personally, I felt like I, I had the wind knocked out of me when I heard that they gave up. Um, because I, was, I thought, no, you, you don't understand. We, for so long, act as if they're two different people. The person who joins the military is not the same human being that then is a veteran. And it was, it's crazy. And, and it was very sad and disappointing. So I think you know, we all, again, where we have opportunities to push on those issues, we've got to do it. We've got to get a seamless um, system in place that these men and women go in to serve our country and the whole system of serving and then coming, you know, it's like Admiral Mullen used to say, you know, we spend millions of dollars training them. They come out, we hand them a duffel bag, say good luck. And then the VA is supposed to find them, bring them in. So, uh, you know, we all can play a role in that too. And where we can, we need to have united voices and push. But it's, it's, that to me is shameless, it's, and it's crazy, and it's poor health care, and it's all kinds of other things. So that is the, somehow getting those, the two continuing to push on both secretaries all the way from the bottom up, wherever you can, so that we fix that. Because that's something that, in this day and age, we should be able to fix that. I'm, I'm, my name is Claudia Gary. I'm a freelance writer and also a contributing writer for the VVA veteran. Um, um, four years ago, um, when I wrote, I, I interviewed healthcare providers at a uh, um, Midwestern VA um, outpatient clinic. Um, one of the uh, healthcare providers said something that I thought would be um, good to think about, which is that um, mental health care is not for sissies. It takes a tough person to ask for help, and it takes courage to ask for help. And that sort of message is something that should resonate. And um, I also just wanted to ask a question um, I, for um, Paul. I mean, in, I know your efforts to uh, uh, get rid of the backlog for VA, the VA is, you know, this is something we have to uh, uh, continue for a long time. but. I became aware in interviewing some veterans for the VVA that even after claims had been approved, sometimes it took months or years for them to actually start to receive benefits. Yeah, and there's also about a 14% error rate. So if you appeal your decision, the clock resets to two years. So, and, and I think it's important to note too, it's not just Iraq and Afghanistan vets. It's all generations of vets and tons of Vietnam vets 
that, that are backed up in that system. And the recent suicide uh, information that was released by the VA, I think the average suicide age that they were tracking on was over 50 years old. Um, 70.3% of them are over 50. Thank you, sir. So I think it's important to recognize it's not just the young generation, it's all the men and women who served in the generations prior, and we owe it to them. There was a gentleman there. Hi, I'm Ralph Ibsen with the Wounded Warrior Project. I'd like to just reinforce a point that I think was implicit in the dialogue. Uh, today's topic related to restoring mental well-being, and it strikes me, and I think the point was made, that mental well-being is more than mental health treatment. I think I, th I would, I would <coughs> describe that term as, as reaching a point where one is thriving, a and I think uh, our organization attempts to do that through a holistic range of programs, but I think there's, there's an interesting model in communities across the country in mental health treat veterans treatment courts, which bring together an array of services from mental health to substance abuse treatment, to counseling, to peer support, to employment focus, which really, I think, is, is a model one might look at to realize that, that, uh, that broader goal, which, again, I think goes well beyond simply treatment. Right. Right. Well, I think that Ralph's point about, you know, goes back to this issue of one size doesn't fit all, people need different things, we have to have all the right players at the table. Veterans courts are springing up and have been springing up all over the country, and we're involved with several and several programs because, you know, there is a mental health piece, and there's often it starts with a housing problem and an employment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I guess I would say um, the most critical element for those programs are the same kind, same critical element that we're talking about in when we talk about coordination, collaboration. You got to have follow up and follow through. You can bring all those people to the table. But if you don't then make sure that those steps are followed and that the wraparound services, and that's about leadership, and that's about in each community. So it's, it, uh, it's exciting to kind of hear the themes that we continued, we're talking about and we're hearing echoed in the, in the room um, because it, it really isn't something that we can turn over to anyone else <laughs> to do it. Um, because it, it is, again, complexity, a lot of different pieces, but so much opportunity and progress now that didn't exist eight years ago, you know. Um, so optimistic, yes, but a lot of work yet to be done. You got a question back there? Hi, my name is Leo Katie Conlin. I'm with the American Academy of Physician Assistants. I myself am also a physician assistant. First, thank you for uh, this today for the panel, and thank you for Aspen Institute for providing this opportunity for this forum. Um, I just want to say a couple, um, uh, many of you talked about the whole continuity of care. Um, but one of the things I didn't hear is when you talked about engaging providers of the community, not just mental health providers, but also non-mental health providers. And I guess specifically what I think about when I think about the missing piece of the puzzle are the physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and physicians who are primary health care providers. Oftentimes, we're the first line of defense to um, ask, to screen, to link things like chronic stomach pain and anxiety to PTSD or headaches and violent behavior to TBI. Um, so I just want to hear in the conversation more about how we also train our civilian health care providers. Our organization is working with the Ron Stepto group to figure out how we can get that type of training out to civilian primary health care providers. That's a good question. Thank is you. there training? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and actually thank you for bringing that up. And, and uh, um, there are a lot of great efforts not right now uh, in terms of integrating care. And so it, it's something that I sort of think about not, um, all, like an automatic, it's happening, but I didn't talk about it. So in all the community work that we're doing, we reach out to the physicians, the physician's assistants, the nurses, because that's when I was saying at the beginning, this whole notion of mental health as if it's some separate entity that exists over here only if you have a mental health problem, as opposed to it's part of the whole uh, being. Um, so yes, that's critical that we include the health care. And it is the direction, by the way, that the mental health profession is heading um, for other reasons. It's about um, how we think about health care. So if we're not doing it in this population, it'd be like, you know, we're way behind the times anyway, so thank you. But that is, um, efforts now are, in, in the White House's Joining Forces initiatives, there's all kinds of links with uh, medical centers, making sure that those folks, their folks are being trained on the mental health issues because they often are the first line 
And you know, pediatricians is a big issue for me because I'm a child psychologist because they, we want them to know what to ask. So you're right. And um, luckily, there is a lot going on to integrate all of that. It's critical. And is there a good information line or website that the physician's assistants could go to, to to find out where to get training for this sort of thing? Well, I, do you want to go ahead? Sure, Jim. I, I, would, I would say the first stop uh, in, from, from the federal agency would be, would be DECO, so Defense Centers of Excellence. Uh, is, is an excellent resource for that. And um, you're already with the right right guy. I mean, the Steptoe Group was, was one of the innovators in the idea of uh, military cultural competency for behavioral health care providers and for, for medical providers writ large. Uh, you know, when they, you guys stepped your program in, um, uh, 2008. yeah, 2008 with uh, uh, Walter Reed. Um, but, but there are other organizations and entities out there that, that do cultural competency training for behavioral health care providers and, and for medical care providers writ large. There's not a lot, I'll tell you that much, but there are, there are out there. <coughs> sir? First, I want to congratulate Aspen oh, Institute. My name is George Safakis. got the mic. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> you go ahead. You got the floor. George Safakis, <laughs> uh, from a fellow we work with, the physician assistants, and also represent a, a portion of this dialogue that I think has been um, uh, remiss today in being mentioned, which is youth engagement. Uh, we represent the, uh, the future health professionals, uh, HOSA future health professionals, and it's a pipeline of about 150,000 students that are all going into healthcare. And so I think part of the equation is redefining healthcare to turn it into health. And how do we do that? And, and including, uh, you know, the youth engagement in this equation is really part of the solution from our perspective. Sir? Yeah. We have a mic over there? Yeah, I have a question. Nope. No. He snagged it, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Jeffrey Lynn from Senator Angus Kane's office. I was wondering, since uh, Mr. Weisskopf brought it up about older veterans from other wars, we can hear you. that because of the possibility of, say, for example, chaining CPI to both Social Security benefits, for example, how that would affect older vets given their limited resources. No way. Chain CPI, that's way outside my reach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Se Senator Sanders has been, has been leading on, on chain CPI. We've been really involved in, in, in trying to figure out how to make sure that it, it, it doesn't overflow into impacting veterans. So um, without going too deep into the weeds, um, I think you know, Senator Sanders has made it a priority since he's taken over the, the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, I'm sure your boss is probably involved as well, um, and we've got some stuff on on our website as well. If we can start going to change CPI, everybody will definitely be asleep. Yes. I've, I've pointed to this guy three times. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Greenberg. I'm a clinical research psychologist uh, from Alzheimer's Institute. I actually had the pleasure of training under Dr. Ka Dr. Taft, what feels like a long, long time ago now. Um, but part of uh, what I wanted to ask the group about and actually kind of talk to them a little bit about how uh, we can partner to uh, work on some of these issues. One of my big concerns is that since the start of the war, one of the things that is truly lacked in, in sort of grand scale has been programs and models really routed in science and strong evidence bases. And uh, having worked for <coughs> Navy Medicine for two years, one of the things we would frequently see is the urge and need to spend money, launch programs, and get things moving with no real sort of internal metric or mechanism to measure whether these things are working or not, or whether they're even routed in sort of the, you know, the foundations of science that uh, uh, we already exist. Uh, a good example of that would be we spent many, many millions of dollars providing care to, um, to our service members and to our veterans, but we don't actually have a really understanding of what it is they're getting when we say they're receiving care. Are uh, they receiving evidence-based care? And if, if they are receiving evidence-based care, to what degree of fidelity is, is that actually rolling in? And so part of my concern and my interest is launching sort of uh, longitudinal and really foundational research models, which are going to provide key answers so you actually get return on investment for the dollars you spend as opposed to uh, just more money spent. Thank you. Well, again, I think in that area, too, there's some great efforts already underway. I mean, we're, we're partnering with um, some, a VA researcher out in California where um, she's doing some very interesting, innovative work on evidence-based care training for uh, community mental health professionals. So accessing our network, providing that training, following to see if they're using it and what happens. So um, I, I'm a pragmatist, and so um, I believe that we should continue pursuing as many different avenues, 
But again, some foundations are going to want to want to put money into research, and they should. But there's also sometimes research that, at, frankly, doesn't lead us any further down the road. Um, and so we have to be research just for research sake isn't isn't always the best plan either. So um, I guess my position is you're right. Let's keep looking at programs, but. Um, let's also make sure that it's a balance and that there are some things we know that we need to do more of in terms of programmatic. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's very, very well said. Um, I think, for example, I'm in the domestic violence area and we don't need to do another study to know um, do people with PTSD have higher rates of domestic violence. Um, and we do know that there's a lot of treatments and interventions out there that are very effective for PTSD and various other problems. I think um, but I, I agree with what you're saying, Jeff. It's, it is critically important for too long. You know, people have thrown out, or DOD has thrown out programs that, that hasn't necessarily been shown to, to work, uh, maybe because of, you know, ex expediency issue. We need to do something fast. So I think it is important to do evidence-based programs. Uh, one other kind of important point that I think is that we do know uh, about a lot of programs that are effective. There has been a lot of research showing different programs work. Are, are effective and they work. So what we need to do is then partner with those in the community to get them out. And I think that's really the next step. We, we have a pretty good idea of what works and the next step is to get it out into the community and do, do evaluation of how, how that works. So not just your traditional clinical trial, but more of studies of when you actually do the, do the program in the community. Are clinicians able to do it well? Do, do people come and do the group? Um, what are that? What do the outcomes look like? I think that's really kind of the next step in, in this um, issue. I think the, the gentleman there has been raising his hands. Uh, my name is Jeff Hensley. I'm actually one of the uh, IAVA members up here with Paul, and uh, uh, we're talking about the VA backlog. But back home in Texas, I'm, I'm a counselor, and I'm, I'm a brand new counselor. In fact, I just graduated in December, courtesy of the GI Bill. Uh, and uh, I work at a uh, therapeutic writing center. We do uh, uh, therapeutic horsemanship with veterans. And here's the issue that I'm running into. I mean, we're nonprofits, so we don't have any money. That's one big issue. But the, uh, the other thing is we are inundated with guys that want to come out and do this program, but the VA won't work with us. And uh, I, I don't exactly know why. I don't know if they think of it as an alternative therapy. They think that we, uh, we don't have enough of a, a history of, uh, of you know, evidence-based uh, practice, and that's true. I mean, it's it's pretty new. But what I do know is that their uh, their symptoms improve, their overall functioning improves, and in a lot of ways, they we become the gateway to the VA. Yeah. They come out there, they have a good experience with us working with other vets, and then they uh, they move on to the VA. So I'm interested in in how I uh, I go ahead and open some of those doors. And <laughs> <laughs> it's an it's an interesting <laughs> question about alternative therapies, and yeah. and is uh, is there enough openness to trying them or funding them? I, I think those are great programs. I, obviously, I'm not speaking on behalf of the VA. I, I've um, worked with the, those groups myself, and I've talked to veterans who have gotten a lot from those programs. Again, I can't speak to how the VA is, is working with you, but I'll kind of applaud you for, for your efforts there. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I, I think that we, and, and the VA has adopted other yoga, acupuncture, you know, other kinds of alternative care. So, and I, equine therapy, we work with many equine therapy groups through Given Hour. You know, so keep doing what you're doing. Try to get into it with your local, take them to lunch, dinner, whatever you need to do, because they will eventually, it'll trickle down that it's good what you're doing, and thank you for doing that. So I know we need that. I, I really like the idea of alternative therapies in, in a, you know, different, uh, in a different context um, uh, than equine therapy. I like the idea of alternative therapies of, of getting wounded, ill, and injured service members, and we were talking about how do you touch them to the left of the D214 before they get out. Uh, why don't we run? Why don't we walk into those war transition units and provide them with opportunities to go in their communities and serve, to get off the couch, to get out of the treatment centers, to get into their communities and serve? That's the real question. So in 2011, G General Shoemaker visited Washington State, uh, and in he he engaged uh, over a hundred wounded and injured service members in service projects. It was a critical component of the recovery and rehabilitation. And we always talk about the person. So I want to share a quote with you guys. This is this is from a service member that was a part of that project in 2011. He said, I'm a volunteer by nature. Uh, this is Specialist Michael Ballard. Now that I'm an injured and I can't do my job, I still want to give back. When I'm given the opportunity to do something for my community, I'm all over it. Uh, that's an alternative therapy that can work, and it can work to scale. 
I think we're going to have to end it there. I'm sorry. Uh, there's, I think everybody will be here for a few minutes afterward if people want to In come fact, up. I'm uh, speaking I'm for inviting. you guys. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm inviting everyone to stay and talk with the panelists. But first, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists and our moderator. Extraordinary conversation. And I'd be very remiss indeed, uh, no one puts this on alone. So I need to thank Paul, every single one of the panelists for helping to fill this room. I want to thank the communications office for being so patient with us. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, John Shelton, for giving us the idea and actually supporting it. Uh, and of course, thank you, Peter, for funding it along with Pharma. So uh, with this, I conclude. And uh, stay tuned. We're going to have uh, an event in Aspen, uh, which we will be reporting on. And expect something um, of a commentary after that, as well as online training. And uh, we're going to be rolling out the next topic of importance, which is suicide uh, intervention and prevention. Thank you again. Thank you.